my name is Eula Kim with Hims, and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. We have an exciting program for you, but before we get started, I would like to highlight a few things so you know how to participate in today's event. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application engagement tools you can use. All the engagement tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. If you need technical support during today's event, click the question mark icon in the navigation menu at the bottom of your screen to find answers to frequently asked questions, or you can type your questions into the Q&A widget to the right of the media player. You can use the same box to submit questions to the speakers at any time. And if we don't get to all your questions today, we will follow up with you offline. Engage with today's content and let us know how you're feeling with the emoji reactions. If you miss anything, don't worry. You'll receive an email within 24 hours with a link to the on-demand recording when it becomes available. Now let's get started with today's program. Ultrasound is the wave of the future. Learn to surf. Sponsored by Butterfly. Our speakers today are Dr. John Martin, Chief Medical Officer at Butterfly Network, Mr. Adam Willman, CEO at Goodall Witcher, and Mr. Brandon Taggart, President at Confidi Health. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Martin. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be joined by two esteemed colleagues today in this discussion about ultrasound as the wave of the future. Now, I'm not, I'm not personally a surfer, so I'm looking forward to today learning how to surf, and hopefully Adam and Brandon will help me along the way. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Butterfly Network and a vascular surgeon by trade, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for joining us and then introduce our guests and let them give a little bit of their background. Adam, would you like to start? Sure. My name is Adam Willman, and I'm currently the CEO of Goodall Witcher Healthcare. Um, I have about 14 years in rural healthcare uh, leadership, and so uh, um, and I'm an Aggie and a father, and excited to join all of y'all. And Brandon. Hi, I'm Brandon Taggart. I am the founder and president of Confidi Healthcare IT Consulting. Uh, we are a full-service consulting firm that provides services ranging from imaging informatics, staff augmentation, implementation, uh, as well as vendor selection. Uh, my background personally uh, comes from a uh, clinical imaging background, um, then working in consulting and technical uh, healthcare initiatives. Um, so it provides me with uh, extensive detail working with multiple organizations and being able to learn our uh, uh, learned experiences uh, across the way. Uh, in terms of my personal life, uh, I have a lovely wife and two lovely daughters. I reside in Northern California. So we're fortunate today by obviously now two very experienced executives. And I'm typically as a, as a vascular surgeon in clinical conversations. And so, and oftentimes as physicians, most of us will know, okay, who's the enemy? That's the CEO, the C-suite. But I think today's conversation is a little bit different. And it's really talking about how the clinical and the executives actually come together to help transform healthcare. Because we certainly know that transformation does not occur uh, unless we have both parties together. So I think the first question for you guys is, uh, as you look at imaging, I think we all know that it's a key part of the expenditures that you that you have as, as CEOs. It's part of the important management of things. And, I, and I'll, I'll give the clinical background. And that is, when you think about the practice of medicine, and you don't know exactly what's wrong with a patient at, from just a history and physical, up to 80% of the time, it's simple imaging that answers that question that sends the patient on that journey uh, to getting better, to having the right clinical decisions uh, to get better. So how have you in your, in your roles actually seen the role of imaging evolve over the time of your career? And why do you believe we're at this nexus of a really new stage uh, that we're addressing today? Brandon, I'll let you start. Uh, I'll go ahead and start. Um, well, we've we've seen um, constant shift within imaging, uh, particularly within diagnostic imaging, radiology practices, uh, and the fact that uh, we're the innovators. Uh, we start out in terms of trying out new technological solutions. Um, we've developed from film to moving to digital pathways, and um, that has been um, very helpful. Sorry, I have an intruder. <laughs> um, has been very helpful for uh, other specialties as well to be able to move forward. And uh, <clears throat> in terms of the progress of where we are today, uh, I think it's uh, an expectation. Today, all of us are able to do anything that we need to do in our personal lives at the tip of our fingers 
on our phones. And yet um, that's not necessarily the case within healthcare still today. Um, so moving forward with uh, uh, items like point of care ultrasound, um, our, our ED physicians are, are becoming younger, uh, more adept to uh, capabilities in terms of modalities that they're able to use. And uh, they've been able to do some of these things, but really need uh, IT backing to be able to do them efficiently, effectively, uh, ensure that they have uh, solutions at their fingertips and can be successful in terms of um, charging for their time as well. So I'll, I'll pause there, but those are a few of the key items that uh, come, come to mind. You know, I, I completely agree with all of that. And I would just add one more thing. Um, the progression of our radiology departments are constantly going to a safer modality, whether it's new technology to lower the amount of exposure to our patients, whereas uh, point of care ultrasound doesn't have any uh, side effects for radiology or ra uh, radiation treatment or anything. So. I, I couldn't add much more other than there's the safety aspect as well as for us in our organizations, we constantly are looking for more efficiencies, of course, but also lowering the cost of health care. We're, we're being asked to lower the cost of health care and, and these point of care items are becoming more cost effective for anyone, any organization to deploy. So I, I would kind of add that really pushing the radiology departments because that's our that's our most expensive department to operate and to to um, put in capital items. So it's interesting you mentioned radiology and, and more importantly, ultrasound, a point of care ultrasound. Obviously, if you look at the statistics, it is ultrasound is the fastest growing imaging modality that's out there. And certainly with the introduction of handheld devices, we're beginning to see the shift out of ultrasound being a radiology department asset to one that's now moved out into all the other specialties. Are you seeing that in your institutions, that it's not just now a radiologist and an ultrasonographer performing these tests, but now clinicians in different specialties are doing it? I'm sure you've seen the emergency department and critical care probably used to it, but I think we're starting to see all these other specialties get in the game. Has that been your experience as well? I know that is, oh, sorry, Brandon. No, go ahead, Adam. I was going to say we have started, we're early on in our deployment of uh, point of care ultrasound. Um, so, but we have seen a big shift of being able to do more in the office. We are not having to navigate your patient to um, go into the radiology department for a study, then to be read and brought back where, where our providers at uh, the primary care physicians in their clinic are being able to use that, whether it's ultrasound or ultrasound guided, you know, injections or just getting a quick idea that might actually find something that warrants additional more in-depth studies, which then you go into your radiology department. So, and again, it's, um, treating at the time. It's it's efficient of time of the physician as well as the patient, um, where it's not taking days to get back or hours. They can find what they need to do and do it right then. So we have started seeing a, a big shift. And then really, we're starting to also explore having nurses use it. So it's expanding not just you know providers, but now we have nurses that are able to use it to do their job more efficient and better. So it's it's really kind of remarkable where we're going. So Brandon, in your hospital, are you having the clinicians kind of knocking on your door and saying, we, we need access to this kind of technology? Or are you driving from the top down and saying, I would like to provide you this technology because we think it's going to be a lower cost of care and a more efficient care? Or is it a combination of both? It's a combination of both. So I, I work with a multitude of hospitals. And I, what I see right now is, I mean, just to kind of go back to, to Adam's point, um, is that most of the time, uh, ED physicians, emergency physicians are really driving uh, this need for point of care ultrasound. And there, there's a, a key distinction in the fact that uh, they're utilizing this mostly as a blunt tool. And then that's potentially leading on to additional um, diagnostic exams performed by a trained sonographer. Um, and, and so with that, um, these solutions, yeah, definitely uh, a, a greater demand of having this available to them. And 
I'm, I'm sorry to your question, John, if you could repeat that. I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm covering that as well. Yeah, I think it's, it, you know, I think very often in technology, and I know I was I was the pest at the CEO's office. If I had new technology coming on that I wanted to bring into the system, I was driving it from the bottom. But we've also seen, you know, particularly w- with our company, that CEOs and CIOs ha- have really gotten the buzz. They actually mm-hmm. understand that the value of actually having that imaging at the bedside so that better clinical decisions and information can be at hand. And so we're seeing driving coming down from the top as well into the clinicians. And I'm wondering if you guys are engaged in that same process or is it kind of the classic, the doctors are asking for new stuff? <laughs> uh, I would say clinical drivers are probably the, the main component. Um, it, what's also a main component though, is it comes from the CFOs of, well, we're doing this, why aren't we charging for this? Mm-hmm. Um, so that comes into play as well, but if you're going to start charging for something, you also want to make sure that you're doing it exceptionally well. Um, so there's, there's training components tied in with that because, uh, from a clinician standpoint, um, sonography is, is a specific skill and it needs to be learned. So if there isn't a program to back that, uh, that could be problematic, but in, just to answer your question, um, yeah, I think it's mostly a clinical driver at this point with, Definitely some some keen eyes from CIOs and technology to say, we need to support this. Maybe then as, as a corollary to that, in your circles, when you guys get together at your level, at your meetings and exchanging ideas among colleagues, is this discussion going on? So is there a greater awareness at the C-suite level of the movement that's actually happening? And are you sharing ideas of best practices on how to really deploy at scale? I would say within my circle, I might be the early adopter, the one that kind of took it on. Um, Kind of your previous question to kind of set the tone where we're at in my organization, I did have a clinician ask for it and we kind of put it off and I kind of looked at it and it was one of my conferences that we actually got to attend in person where I saw the butterfly. And one of our driving forces right now is trying to improve our patient satisfaction within our um, labor and delivery department and within our OB patients. And so I kind of started pushing it more because I looked at this this point of care ultrasound more as a patient satisfaction for our OB patients because my doctors can, you know, do a quick ultrasound at every visit during the process and not only show them the progress at the main, you know, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, 32, you know, we were able to bring it in and it was kind of me seeing it as a patient satisfaction because I thought the price point wasn't far off. And so with that being said, we've just seen that I was kind of an early adopter, but the more we kind of see some benefits. And again, for me, it was kind of the billing was secondary for my decision. And so now that it's seeing some benefit, I do have conversations with individuals, you know, how are we going to, you know, compete, uh, 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 compete for patients with, you know, larger faci- facilities. And so to keep our patients at home, this is one of those kind of, I hate to say it, we kind of looked at it as this is a cool toy that we're utilizing for patient satisfaction that has just blossomed. And um, I've been very pleased with what we've seen here, even though it's been an early adoption. Um, And I am now starting to get more calls from individuals. What do you know about this butterfly? Some, Some organizations have had it and just never really knew what they were doing. And so now kind of sharing those aspects of how we've kind of looked at implementing it here. So having a handheld device kind of changes the game. As you guys know, we've had carts around the hospital system. You've had them as well. They're a limited resource. But now we have a device that every physician can have and can make instant decisions at the bedside. So now you're looking at a number of devices, you know, if you will, roaming around your institutions. What kind of challenges have you seen from a, from a logistical perspective of deploying these devices? And, and maybe it's from just keeping track of where they are to an IT infrastructure to connecting them into your system. Have you found some challenges associated with that and how have you overcome them? So I'll go ahead and start. Um, From a challenge perspective, I mean, uh, the biggest challenge to date uh, with almost every organization is is cost. 
Um, it's, it's having the budgets, no matter how minute they might be, to be able to go out and procure all new equipment. Um, if you were to walk through probably your local emergency department, uh, you would find some rather antiquated um, uh, ultrasound carts meant for point of care. And the quality of such has drastically changed over the last decade, if not last five years, especially with these handheld devices available now. So uh, I've, I've also seen at times, just based off of prior statement of cost, that physicians based off of clinical need will go out and purchase their own. Um, so if an organization isn't able to afford it, that's one thing, but there, there is definitely an ROI it, it, that I think maybe needs to be better educated or uh, pushed forward so that uh, we move forward on these types of, of purchases because there's also a, a VOI as well, the value associated with patient care. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of my take on, on what I've seen thus far with a multitude of organizations. I, I would say we, we've kind of seen a different challenge and um, our organization, we wanted a really, um, really well connected. One medical record, have everything kind of interface together so that providers aren't having to log into multiple systems. That's something that we've really struggled for. And so our main challenge of really getting this implemented, even for the billing and uh, medical record side is the interface with EMR. Um, our EMR is backlogged so far that we're trying to implement it now, but we don't see the interface with our EMR to make sure that our charts are complete and keep that history. That's our biggest challenge right now is really that interconnectivity that we're, we're, we're wanting, but we are not getting in a timely fashion. But again, we're talking about point of care. And so everything needs to be quicker and more efficient. And that includes this interface. Um, lastly, uh, the challenge is, is almost not having enough probes. Um, the, uh, our clinic is connected to the uh, hospital. So, you know, the FBOB will go leave clinic to run to the OB or L&D department to, you know, to, to start a delivery and forget his, get his uh, probe. And so all of a sudden we don't have one in L&D. So now we got to get one there. So it's, um, it is handy, but sometimes you just kind of forget them just like your cell phone and you run off when you're in a rush. And so it's kind of having some backups in different areas. Yeah, I think you bring up a couple of good points that I think are really important. And I, I think part of the evolution of understanding that when ultrasound becomes something that's at the bedside in the hands of clinicians to make rapid decisions, that connecting that, that infrastructure becomes a critical part of this. How do you bring in that software backbone that allows you to do the workflow to make it efficient? Because, you know, as a physician, it's one thing to, to just get the test and answer the clinical question that I need to. But I have to have in the system, because my CFO wants me to, I need to be able to order the study. I need to have a report. I need to generate a bill. It needs to be kept in the record and have an image. So there's a lot of workflow that goes associated with that. And we also brought up early the concept of training. We've got all these new physicians now that are coming on board that want to learn how to do this quickly because they see the value that has to become part of the package. So I think one of the challenges that we've certainly faced uh, is how do we incorporate all of that in? And it's a big part of the ecosystem that we think is a big, a big part of this. You can't just isolate it and say and think about it as, I'm buying an ultrasound machine. Uh, it's not just the handhelds are not just lower cost. You really need to step back and look at it as I'm buying a, a process of care and what goes with it if you want to be efficient. And, and as you've looked at this, Adam, you've, you've identified that situation. If you just look at it as an isolated piece of equipment, you're missing a big part of the struggle and you're losing the real value proposition that can be made if you have both connected in what you want to do. Have you found yourselves um, getting the question of, ultrasound versus standard imaging, like chest x-rays. I think I bring that up as a clinician. Are you starting to see people's kind of abandon an old way of actually getting information yet? Or is that still too new within your institutions? I wouldn't say that they've abandoned chest x-rays, but I mean, if we're gonna talk about clinical efficacy, um, ultrasound is, is shown in multiple studies that it's capable of being more efficient in, in, in terms of uh, diagnosing uh, certain certain um, diseases. So I, I use this as an example um, 
COVID-19. I mean, I, I think everybody's heard that term too much, so I, I was avoiding it. But COVID was a perfect example of the use of point of care handheld ultrasound devices for di early diagnosis. Uh, it was fast, it was effective, um, and it was you know, cutting down on the amount of chest x-rays needed and found out that actually ultrasound seems to be more effective than a chest x-ray in terms of diagnosing for COVID. Um, so, I mean, that, that's been a huge advantage. Um, I think that there are other advantages as well going forward in the future of, of moving with ultrasound, especially when we talk about ionizing radiation and um, starting with, you know, image lightly, image gently, and ensuring that our radiation doses are less within our institutions. So all of that factors in for better care. I couldn't be more excited to hear a CEO actually quote clinical data. So that, that, that warms my heart because so often I feel like I have to bring that to the table and there's that question. And I think you very accurately summarized data that's actually been in the literature for long, lung ultrasound trumps chest x-rays. In fact, one of, one of my big questions, why are we still doing those? And, and there are great data out there to show it's much more accurate, obviously much safer, much quicker if you do it at the bedside and you can answer those decisions and make great make clinical judgments at the time and begin therapy. So when you, how much data, and I'll share this to both of you because it's a really important part of the mission we're trying to on, what data do you actually need? How much economic data and clinical data does it take to convince your CFO to go from buying maybe one or two uh, ultrasound uh, machines to have around your unit to saying, you know what, I need every physician to have one of these because we know what efficiency is like. So that one or two devices that you're running back to labor and delivery, get, it's not an issue because everybody's got their own. What would it take for you guys to get to that place? You know, if for us, it was just unique. I mean, we, I, we, we really saw it as a part of our mission of trying to um, create a better atmosphere of care for our OB patients. And so we really didn't look at a lot of data other than, man, this is awesome for our patients because we can get a picture. I mean, seriously, it was kind of weird that it was the patient satisfaction side of it that we saw with OB. Um, but when we started seeing, you know, kind of going down the road with looking at what we can bill and collect and, and, it became the it became apparent that it's one of the low one of the pieces of equipment that has a ROI, but the break even point is so so much quicker because of the cost effectiveness, and so we kind of backed into the data now where we're looking at it, trying to keep up with it. Um, it was really kind of unique when I went to purchase this. I took it to my board because um, it wasn't budgeted at the time. And, and it was my board who said, well, are you sure that's enough? Why don't you go ahead and add more probes to it? So it was even my board seeing from a point of view, uh, from a point of care, how much efficient we could gain the patient satisfaction. And then again, there is a return on investment. We're still real early in the deployment, so we don't have all of that. And the adoption rate from a provider to provider is different, but we are seeing some of the faster adopters are starting to really push some of the billing and some of the other ones are slowly getting more comfortable with it. So, um, we're, we're, I would say we have to, we're unique. We didn't have to go to the CFO and beg. I just kind of put my neck out there and said, let's do this and see what it does. How about your experience, Brandon? Yeah, uh, probably very similar. I've, I've, uh, I've been down this road. Um, I've, I've presented this on multiple occasions um, to different organizations. And I really, uh, the things that have been stated previously are, are correct. The ROI is, is pretty easy to find. Um, it's in early on too. I mean, in most cases, you see ROI in year one. Because the fact of the matter is, is for most of these types of exams, it's money left on the table. Otherwise, uh, they don't have a mechanism for billing. So you have uh, physicians entering notes into the EHR. Um, they may get, you know, some of their pro fees, but they're not getting the tech fees. Um, and then the variance in terms of quality of such uh, varies greatly in terms of how, how that workflow is working for them. Um, I, I think, you know, this, 
this is a very easy value proposition, um, or at least it should be in terms of what you need um, and and what you can get in return um, very quickly. There are a lot of other IT initiatives that are quite complicated. Um, I can say that, yes, you can go out and buy ultrasound carts. You can go and buy other, you know, differing handheld devices, but without an actual workflow solution, um, it becomes problematic. Uh, you look at uh, maybe leveraging your vendor neutral archive to try to do that. Um, that works for some, depending on your ventral, vendor neutral archive, but it also depends on your team that you have incumbent to your organization because that requires upkeep, maintenance, and understanding of those data flows. Um, finding that a lot of organizations are looking at uh, solutions, third-party solutions that tie in and integrate, have done this well multiple times with differing EHRs, uh, it really, it, it simplifies the process. Um, it probably actually increases the ROI for not having to, um, you know, chase that rabbit in terms of uh, a homegrown solution or a modified VNA solution. So what you're saying, if, if I'm paraphrasing this right, is that obviously that IT partnership is a critical part of deployment at scale and ease of integration of a, a complete workflow solution is really something that you're looking for so that adoption is not another big issue for you as an institution, that you can recognize the value quickly. And you think that's something really, if you had advice to give to, to us, it said, make sure you bring that to the table because that's a critical part of what we need to be successful. I would say that for most organizations, that holds true, yes. Is there any other kind of information that you think that would be helpful for other, you, you guys are obviously innovators here. I mean, if you sold this on patient satisfaction at your institution, that's a, that's a pretty good salesman. I think I, I want you to work work for us and sell stuff because that's pretty good. Um, have you heard others of what information might be needed? Any advice you would give and say, go after this data because this data would be helpful for us to expand or for others that are less innovative than you to adopt? So for us, um, one thing that I would add, and I meant to say this earlier, is we've also seen um, with the adoption of some physicians utilizing the point of care ultrasound, it's allowed my actual ultrasound, because I only have one and they're here 40 hours a week. And so we're not backlogged for two, three weeks or trying to have them get, you know, stay 10 hours a day to get everybody in. And so it's really made our radiology department more efficient because we're not sending smaller studies and then returning them for more in-depth studies because they found something. So this has really kind of helped the efficiency of the radiology department and them being on board with this has also helped, um, you know, really integrate it into our system because they support this and they're actually helping us support our physicians as they learn to use these devices more. So you suggest that the, the process of learning. So has education been a big part of the challenge for you and educating across the system? And and maybe one of the ways I've always looked at it is I've gone through a couple deployments of, of new electronic records, both Cerner and Epic. And, and there are ways in which we learned that broadly very quickly that I think might be applicable to, to training physicians. But have you seen education to be a, a roadblock or maybe a hurdle to adoption sure. at your institutions? So education's not the roadblock. Having the time to sit down with the education is the roadblock. We've started really deploying this and we've now hit two new waves of uh, the coronavirus, which Again, my doctors here in our organization work the clinic. They also work in the ER. They're rounding. We don't have hospitalists. They're doing it all in our facility. And so you start throwing these surges on them. They don't have the time because we're seeing 40 patients a day for, you know, COVID related issues. And so the education that we have been able to get is wonderful, but it's almost like with any project within the hospitals now, we start it and then you got to put it on pause. Well, after two months of not doing much on it, now you got to re-go back to start at square one. And so it's really trying to find a system where they have just enough time to really practice with it 
before the next wave. And hopefully it's over because Brandon, like you, I really didn't want to say COVID again. Um, but that's really been our issue really is the training. And so that's why we're trying to utilize some in-house training um, because it's just it, it, it's always been put on hold. And some of the adoption is because maybe the provider doesn't feel as um, as um uh, it isn't at the skill level that they really want to be at to start billing and utilizing it fully and trusting. Um, and so we got to gain that uh, that conf- confidence for them to utilize it. And it's going to be education, training and experience. But if you're putting it on hold every two months, it, it, it gets hard to get there. Great. So. So, ahead, John, you, you, you'd asked a question early on. You said, what, what do you need to know? Um, to be successful um, moving forward with point of care ultrasound. Uh, I, I mean, we talked earlier about the fact that uh, at least from my perspective, what I've seen, a lot of this has been clinically driven. Um, and with most solutions, ultimately, um, the individuals that will be using this, the providers, probably are the most important um, in the sense that you ensure that they're happy with what they're utilizing. So uh, in terms of a vendor selection process or something along those lines, uh, definitely making sure that you're getting the hands of the users, the physicians on these probes, or even in cases outside of physicians um, using these solutions, um, whether it's a handheld device, whether it's the workflow solution associated with it, all of these things need to uh, be vetted. Uh, Of course, increasingly difficult because the strain in terms of uh, work hours that we put on our providers has, has drastically increased in recent years. So what, what, what's different today, let's say? So here we have a device that has unprecedented versatility. You know, we, we're now having ultrasound that can operate in all different venues with all different specialties as we're talking about. And as new artificial intelligence tools come in, to make the device easier to use, easier to interpret, and accelerate that road to competency. Um, what's, what unique challenges do you have in your environment today to keep that adoption from kind of taking off and, and maybe being that big wave, not the little wave that you want to surf? Because both of you, and I'll, maybe I've phrased this differently, both of you articulated very cogent reasons why you should be doing this. You know, th- this was me, and, and candidly, I, I've got an interesting question to ask you in a bit about that. But you've advocated strongly. You've obviously put your necks out. We'll, we'll use that your words, Adam, at doing this. There's obviously something that convinced you to do that. But what would you say really stands in the way now of of everybody in your organization saying this is the new way we practice medicine? That we're going to capture imaging information at the bedside to make better clinical decisions in the hands of every single clinician, whether that's a nurse, a physician, a PA, an NP. Um, and I want this everywhere because I've already seen now clearly that that's the way to go. What's going to keep you from actually sending that message to your organization and maybe to others around the country? I wouldn't say that I would not send the message, but there are um, there are complications along the road and and they need to be known. And I think some of the main complications um, we talked about the clinical aspects just in terms of uh, provider availability. But that problem is going to exist regardless. Um, The the technical issues uh, are probably the ones that I would key in on. That's probably more my my alley anyways. Um, The technical issues are that uh, all organizations have differing EHRs. Um, For some, it's easier. I wouldn't say easy, but easier because there are certain um, acceptable interoperability components to certain EHRs that make tying in solutions uh, relatively straightforward. Um, Then there's custom builds or EHRs that are maybe lesser known or lesser uh, utilized that don't necessarily have the easy um, interoperability uh, points. I'm trying not to get into technical descriptions, not uh, lose anybody, but um, the HL7 messaging in terms of orders and reports all of those factors are, are highly important um, in the ability to accept from a third party. Uh, if those EHRs aren't capable of doing such or require custom changes to be able to do such, 
um, you find yourselves in, in some bigger design discussions to ensure that at the end point, uh, the workflow that you provide back to your providers is smooth and seamless because having them jump from one system to the next just really isn't a, a proposition they're going to like. So one aspect is clinical and training you've mentioned. The other is technical. Um, are they under, are we in a state in healthcare today that finances are still a real problem, even recognizing that maybe there's a real return on investment and this may be that opportunity to get back to health? You know, I think I think with most organizations, finances will always be something in front of that. Um, and, and and with kind of the issues we've talked about, the workforce or the workflow in order to bill and collect for the pre procedures until that's m smoother and more, you know, not a manual process, that does create the issue with the finances. You are... You, there, there are manual ways to bill and collect for it. We have done that, but it does create some inefficiencies when we're trying to gain efficiency. And so I think finances will always be an issue in everything. Um, but I do feel that point of care ultrasound is at a price point now that's going to drive a lot more it, finances won't be as important. And it may actually kind of start pushing some of the cost of um, getting the equipment to the lower side. You know, I think, again, we kind of look at the issues that we raised with COVID. You know, I think some of it's just going to be supply chain. And is that going to interfere with us? And until it doesn't, I think cost is always going to be an issue. And as you look at your journey, what would you say are the key lessons learned along the way? And is there anything you know today that you'd wish you'd known then that would have made the journey easier? Putting this on the roadmap for strategy earlier would probably be uh, the first item. But uh, <laughs> hindsight's always twenty twenty. Well, I'm tr we're trying to extract your hindsight so it can become <laughs> foresight for all these others that are actually listening to this. Yeah, I, I think uh, other than that, I mean, there, that's, that's probably the main, main factor for me. No regrets. No regrets. No regrets. Adam? You know, I, 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 it's a difficult question because you, we have learned some stuff, but nothing that would make me change the way we implemented it. I think it, it, it was really, it's kind of, a, I mean, top down, when the board can see the benefit of this from a CEO, it's easy sell for, for what was for me, where cost is, you know, rural and cost kind of are hand in hand. But honestly, I don't think I have any regrets. I don't think we've had any issues. I mean, no issue that we could overcome by better planning, um, whether it's the um, interfacing with our e EHR, you know, that's an issue, but that's not something I can deal with. That's the backlog that they're faced with. Um, so I really don't have any regrets or any issues. Maybe if you do start planning this, get with your EHR earlier. So maybe that when you do implement it, the workflow is not as manual or I guess, um, yeah, just really just manual and, and get that going. So maybe it's a better, smoother uptake for everything, for the whole process and not just one aspect at a time. So if you had to throw out between the two of you, the three keys to successful implementation, what would they be? And this is really implementation at scale. You know, we're not just adding a single card into the system. What are those big three that you would, you would give people? Here's my big three. Number one, governance. You need to make sure that you have the right individuals involved in the process from the get-go. And who are be, they? Who are those stakeholders? So you're talking about uh, C-level leadership, your technical teams, uh, clinical stakeholders, or at least representatives of such. Um, and you're, you're essentially looking for your cross-functional teams. Anyone that's going to have interactions with this solution needs to be involved in, in the governance process, or at least in a representative manner, forming of a, a steering committee, something along those lines, to ensure that there's a codified strategy. Okay. And then once you have that, um, there needs to be a vendor selection process. Uh, again, uh, a codified methodology say this is exactly the criteria that we're looking for. This is what we're trying to accomplish. And then going through and trying to do a, a well, uh, 
well quantified uh, vendor selection process. And then from there, ensuring that you have all the components that you need from a budget perspective before you get started and having a well laid out project plan. Those are my three. Any differences from your perspective, Adam? Not really. You know, you got to have the right team in the beginning, the the stakeholders that are really gung ho and passionate about going that way. And really that that may be that is probably the primary driving to make this really work is find those individuals that just love it so much. And then it's just easy implementation from there. And so you get those what we call super users. Um, that way, when you do have to start and stop training due to whatever pandemic or surges you may have, you can just pick it up and you have someone internally. Um, uh, so that, that that's the one thing I just kind of, I guess, expand upon. But I don't really think I have any any difference. What do you see out in the future? You know, do you have a vision for this being, you know, you see where you are today within your organization. You've learned some things. What are your visions for the future uh, going forward? Do you see more expansion across different care venues? Do you see that a, an evolution, if you will, in the way people think about this? Because I can tell you, our, our thinking is pretty straightforward. We know in that historically, I see a patient, I think I have a problem, I order a test to figure out what's going on. The world we see in is I see a patient, I do exam, the imaging is part of that exam, I make a clinical decision, then only use selective imaging where I haven't answered the question yet, which I think has a huge value for a patient, for the doctor, for the system, for everybody. Uh, And so that's the vision we see at going forward, that it now becomes incorporated in the way we practice medicine. What vision do you guys have for this in the future? Where where do you think we're going to go with this? So I'll I'll start. Um, My vision is I think we're still in the early stages of our enterprise imaging journey. And and by that, I'll I'll qualify it because the term enterprise imaging means many different things to many different people. But that is the consolidation of all imaging specialties and components. So when we think about when we talk about imaging, we're always thinking about diagnostic imaging, radiology. That's cardiovascular, it's pathology, it's ophthalmology, oncology, um, dental. Uh, If the eyes can see it, it's a part of imaging. And having a strategy that encompasses all of those components uh, is going to be the look forward. The, The other look forward is we're talking about AI solutions and uh other components that help assist with with diagnosis that'll tie into that entire strategy, as well as uh, components for um, you know integrating all of these things that right now have an organizational disparity, but they all tie into the same factor: patient care. Period. So I think that's going to be the vision of the future and. Um, there's going to be some major components of that that are going to tie into uh, data science, especially as part of the the AI components that are being added in. Adam, your future? You know, I I think about this a lot. Um, To me, kind of like what Brandon was saying, it's almost – it's hard to predict the future because we're such at an early start and implementation where, you know, our journey started with patient satisfaction and now fast forward, we're looking at nurses utilizing it. And so for us, I don't know where the future is going to hold, but it is going to be much more in depth and it will become a common use. Um, and we will continue to push that envelope for you, what Brandon said, patient satisfaction and quality of care. And so it's really kind of unique that it's so early. I really don't know what the future holds, but I do kind of see it in every physician or provider's pocket that they just take out when they need it. And and nurses utilizing it on the floor for various um, vitals or new type of vitals. And so... It, there's really, uh, uh, und- uh, I don't know. I mean, the future is really kind of hard to really uh, predict with this type of uh, technology. 
I guess if we're really good at predicting the future, <laughs> we've been predicting the, a lot of different things and being actually successful at it. I guess as we bring this to a close, I've got an idea of how we might do this to emphasize some of the key points that you guys brought out. So what I'm going to do is bring up a key concept and, and I'll look for what do you instantly think of when I bring up these concepts? Um, give me your kind of one to two sentence kind of punchline that you can leave people with so that they can think about these things um, as they're trying to decide how they're going to embark upon this new journey into, into a new way to, to a new wave of imaging within their organization. So I'll start with the first one. Uh, and, and maybe that's because if there's no margin, there's no mission. I'll start with ROI. Adam, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, ROI. I would say it's real quickly to um, uh, get your cost back after starting within a very short period of time compared to typical ultrasound uh, equipment. Uh, I'll follow up and say that ROI is, um, uh, yeah, it, there's a very, very quick ROI scale, usually within the first year. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that ROI is, is based off of revenue. And a lot of revenue has been left on the table with point of care ultrasound, um, in which these charges aren't even being occurred. Um, so having a solution that makes that easier and streamlined for physician workflow is, is going to produce results immediately. I think this is a really important concept. People get intimidated with the idea of deploying ultrasound at scale, but I think what people should know and remember from your conversations, that return on investment will come quickly, whether it's revenue in an outpatient environment or whether it's cost savings on an inpatient environment to more carefully leverage the resources that you have inside so that you don't have to have extra CT scans or chest X-rays or MRIs. All right, another one that we talked a lot about, education. Brandon, you go first this time. What do you think of when we say education? You think about education. You think about continual improvement um, and making sure that your providers know how to use a product or your end users know how to use a product. Um, that's key to adoption. Um, if you don't know how to use it, you're going to be frustrated with it. You're going to think it's a poor product and uh, they're going to walk away from it because in the end, if it's not making their lives more efficient and effective, uh, they don't want anything to do with it. So education is key. Uh, there's also quality quotient in the sense that quality needs to be a factor in education in the sense of uh, use of a probe. If it's not easy to learn and doesn't have a standard um, and continual peer review tied to it, um, you could be all over the board. Uh, it's, it's, it's a requirement. I, I wouldn't even say it should be a question. I, I really can't add much to that. I, I agree with everything he said. Education is going to drive your ROI, your quality. The more you are able to use it and feel confident with what you're doing with it, the better off you are in implementing it and really getting it to take hold in your organization. Yeah, and I think one of the other key points I always think about with this is, and, and remember this is a practice, just, you need time to learn. And that's been a real challenge with physicians today. So as you think about embarking the education and training people, got to come up with a strategy where people have time to learn. That's why I love the personal nature of having your own ultrasound device, because learning doesn't just have to occur during the daylight hours. They can do after hours. If you have your own device, you can take it home, you can practice. So a key part of this new world of handhelds where everybody could potentially have their own. Uh, workflow. You know, we, we think a lot about imaging. Oh, I just brought a device. We don't think often about the workflow that goes along with it. Um, Adam, you can go first here. What do you think of when you think of workflow? I think of when you implement this, it has to be naturally within how they're comfortable practicing now. It needs to be convenient, quick. It doesn't need to add any more time. And so that workflow really also drives, you know, from your education, but that workflow really brings it into the practice and it needs to be natural. It, it doesn't need to be additional work to make it successful. I know Brandon workflow is a really important part of the advice you give quite, uh, quite consistently. So I'll be interested in your impression here. Yeah, I, I would agree with Adam. Um, obviously, it needs to be natural. Following a workflow that is is inherent versus trying to bend a provider or user to follow a workflow that's technical. Um, we need to be complementary to the clinical workflow. Um, many technological advancements and solutions that have been put in place 
don't do that currently. So time is already taxed with our providers. Um, adding one more thing isn't adding just one more thing to them. It's, it's uh, the straw that breaks the camel's back. So the workflow is absolutely imperative. Um, this is a lot of the reason of why going back to ROI, charges aren't, aren't being incurred because it's, uh, we're, we're trying to, in a sense, survive uh, just to do what's right in terms of patient care and forgetting about the other aspects behind that. Yeah, I, you got to make it easy. I think easy is kind of the magic word here for docs. If docs are going to adopt it uh, or any healthcare protection, it's got to be easy. And that easy applies to we need to make it easy to learn. We need to, and that's where we're building artificial intelligence tools that will make it so easy to learn, easy to use, and easy to imp implement all the necessary data that's part of workflow into the system, which includes you know, an interface into your EHR so it's not some extra step along the way. That's got to be a critical part of this because this data is, is critical, not just for clinical decision-making, but it's necessary for billing and in that whole quality assurance program. So I think that that workflow becomes critical and that interface becomes critical and it has to be easy. Well, all of that though, when you start bringing up software and, and, and medical devices, we know capital equipment is a big thing. What about cost? What, what, what do you think of with cost in the new world of handhelds? I, I'll start because that's very near and dear to our heart. Um, the handhelds are much less uh, expensive than your traditional uh, uh, carts. And so the cost really, it's important, but right now it is the lower cost and it will have a faster um, rollout period because more people can get their hands on these handhelds and it, and it's scalable you don't have to go with a hundred handhelds maybe you start off with a certain few and so the cost is important but with handhelds it's really going to drive down the entry level into that it's much easier for more people to get into Brandon? Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add. Adam Adam's exactly right. I think the adoption rate is going to uh, increase because uh, handheld has less cost. Uh, I think the things that come up um, in terms of cost versus value uh, would be items associated with a, a lot of these handheld devices are seen still to date as blunt tools. Um, so as the technology improves, and is more capable in terms of a single probe able to do multiple functions, uh, I think uh, you're going to see even more adoption and it's going to make even more sense from a value proposition. Yeah, and I, I think where I see this in the, in the comments, you guys, sometimes now, and I think we've gotten there now, that less is actually more. The, the less this device costs, the more people can have it, the quicker they can learn, the better value we can deliver to the organization. And I'm, I'm really excited to see this, dev this device deployed at scale because the cost now makes that actually possible. One of the things, though, that's often associated with less cost, though, is, is less service and, and less support with, with equipment. I think that plays a critical role. What are your thoughts on that? Brandon, you want to go first? Ah, yeah. Service and support is key. Um, it can be the Achilles heel. You can have a great software product and uh, abysmal support and overall it, it comes out abysmal. So the service and support is absolutely key, making sure that the end users feel supported. Um, goes back to education as well, communication of what can be improved, enhancements, and ultimately it comes down to a relationship. Uh, the relationship is key uh, between any vendor and customer to ensure that they have um, a, a regular communication forum for what's working, what's not, and continually improving. Adam, have you seen the same? I have. And, and the other part of that support is being flexible. One thing that we noticed in the last couple of years is you can start a project, end it, you know, because you have a surge of COVID. And so that support, that relationship has to be very flexible and um, covers a lot of media, not just in-house, but maybe uh, YouTube videos and other instruction, but support is number one um, to make these things really work the way they should. I'll, I'll finish with this one, which I think may be the most exciting. And that is the, the change of the venues, the opportunities that handhelds now with this kind of versatility and cost bring 
to, to healthcare of the new venues and the new users that can now have this device. How do you see that? Um, and, and how might you leave our listeners today with, with the same level of optimism that I think both of you feel? Brandon? Uh, I see this as being, and I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again, uh, the, the modern day stethoscope. I, I see this expanding out to a multitude of consumers. Uh, I don't see this as just an in-hospital tool. I see this going outside the bounds with paramedics, medics in terms of uh, military function, um, and potentially into the home for home health care and uh, immediate reporting. The same as we have a thermometer, why can't we have a, a guided uh, handheld ultrasound device as well? I like those no. words, Adam. I, I share the same uh, same thoughts, and, and really, um, there there's no end to how we can use this technology and these applications, and so it's only going to be limited by our imagination. I think that's true. I think there are going to be applications we haven't even thought of yet, and and now as technology evolves, it really opens the door to a new way of healthcare. And, and I, I'll leave with this: I think this has been fantastic. You guys have offered such tremendous insight. I know a few things uh, about medicine, but one I know most of all is, is doctors want to be right. They want to trust the equipment they have. They want to be confident in the decisions that they make. And, and the only thing they like less um, than not knowing what's going on is being wrong. And so now that we have the opportunity to provide better information at the bedside when those initial clinical decisions are being made, I think this opens the door for that to be the case. And I think the future of, of handheld ultrasounds, this will be a wave of change that comes across healthcare. And, and I'm really excited that you two are part of it and candidly leading it. And we're happy to go on that journey with you. And we look forward to others that may be listening today. They can take your words of wisdom to heart and they can join us on this journey going forward. So thank you again for being an important part of such a, such a, a, a critically uh, topical as well as important webinar. Thank you. Yes, thank you. At this time, we have to wrap up. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. We would like to thank our sponsor, Butterfly Network, once again for their support of this webinar. Don't forget to take a brief evaluation at the conclusion of today's event and share your thoughts with us. As a reminder, you'll receive an email within 24 hours to rewatch the on-demand recording of today's session, and it will be available in the HIMSS Resource Hub for a limited time. So feel free to come back and watch at any time. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.